Anyways, our next guest tonight played linebacker at BYU, won back-to-back Mountain West Conference championships in 2006 and 2007, coached six seasons with Bronco Mendenhall in Provo, another five with Bronco in Virginia. Last year, he was the special teams and edge rusher coach at Boise State, and it's a pleasure to welcome home Kelly Papinga to the Wise Guys and back to BYU. Coach, thank you for carving out a few minutes with us on, uh, on Tuesday night and coming on the Wise Guys. Great to see you. Yeah, it's uh, great to be with you guys. It's been a it's been a crazy day for me. So sorry about not getting on earlier. That's okay. How does it feel to be back? You look down. You're wearing a, they got the Sailor Coog shirt on, and and you're you're all back. He's BYU. old school. He's old school with that Sailor Coog deal right there. I love it. I oh, love yeah. it. It was awesome. The the first day I came back and I put on the the BYU logo and just the the blue and being back in the facility and everything. It just felt it felt like home. It felt like where I. I should be at this time, and you know, although I love my time at Boise State and uh, you know uh, at Virginia, and I grew a ton and learned a ton, I uh, just felt like it was time to come back and be able to hopefully apply a lot of those things that I learned over the years back to a program that I love so much that's done so much for me, and yeah, just ready to get to work with these guys, and uh, you know, here comes spring ball here in a couple of weeks, so just getting ready to roll for that. What, what is there something that you missed most? when you were gone from BYU it's, and you may even recognize it more now that you're back, man, I missed that when I was gone. Oh man, that is a great question. There's a, there's a lot of things I missed, but I, I think the thing I probably missed the most was playing in uh, Lavelle Edwards stadium and coaching in Lavelle Edwards stadium and just the atmosphere that uh, you can be involved in, in that stadium week after week after week and uh, just the fan base and how passionate they are. Um, and how much they care, which can go both ways, right? That can be good and bad at times. Mm-hmm. Right, but right. That than uh, than the other way where they don't care much at all and they're they're fair weather. But man, it was uh, it was you know for me going back in 2021 when Virginia came and played here, that was a weird deal just coming back into that stadium. But that night, I I realized I'm like, man, this is what makes this place special. I mean, that night obviously it was a shootout and you know didn't go our way, you know Virginia's way and. Uh, and but the the electricity in that stadium that night, um, man, I just have forgotten about the fan base and how uh, crazy they can get and how loud they are. And just uh, man, I'm just excited to get back in those moments and uh, you know look forward to this season, especially playing some Big 12 games in that in that stadium. I'm I'm super excited to get back into that atmosphere again. Let's go back to that night for just a moment. Um, you give up 734 yards, the Cavalier <laughs> defense, and 66 points. And you're back and experiencing everything you just described. So what was going on in your mind when Algier just kept running for touchdowns? It was bad. I, I can just remember <laughs> you know, Elf and Bronco and Nick Hal and Shane Hunter, all these guys that, you know, we'd won a lot of games in that stadium. And uh, honestly, the best, you know, I can laugh about it now, but honestly, probably one of the worst nights in my coaching career. I was embarrassed. Honestly, I was embarrassed. You know, you come home. I had a lot of family in the stands. We yeah. were six and two at the time. We mm-hmm. felt like we had a really good team, and uh, man, it was just they put a whooping on us like I'd never. I mean, those that was the most points I'd ever I've ever given up as a coach. And so I just, you know, I tell I tell A Rod all the time and Fessy about it all the time. I'm like, man, you guys just rolled. I mean, it was like any anything they did that night too worked. I mean, I, I can't remember how many balls they threw down the field, but it seemed like they caught every one. And then we couldn't tackle Algier. You know, we were like scared of him that night for some reason. I don't know what it was. It was just like the perfect storm hit us. And, and uh, you know, the, you look up at the board. I remember at halftime, I think we were winning at halftime. I think Virginia yeah. was winning like 41 to 38. And I remember I turned to Matt Edwards, who's LaBelle, LaBelle Edwards' grandson. And I said, hey, this is exactly how LaBelle wanted this night, I guess. It's a <laughs> shootout, you know, with Bronco returning back to BYU and all of us. But. Holy crap! Yeah, that's, no, that's a night I want to forget. Nobody, honestly. nobody could stop anyone. Then, if you're just a fan of just high scoring football, those were the best games ever. But uh, and, you know, if you like defense, I guess not. And you're on the defensive side of the ball. <laughs> you're on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, that that was a crazy night. I, I thought that the night started off the right way, though. Um, I, I think Bronco was probably wondering how he would be received back there. And, um, you know, I, I had talked to him afterwards, and, and even after the loss, I think he was taken back a little bit by how warmly 
he was welcomed back and the fans really gave him a great ovation and were glad to have him back and recognize the great contributions he had made to BYU while he was here. And you were part of that as well. What was that like? That was, uh, I think it was really special for Bronco. Cause like you said, I think, you know, not that he, I don't think he showed it all week. And I, I knew he really wanted to win that game bad, you know, just like, you know, all of us that, you know, had played there and coached there. Um, but I think more than anything, I don't think he uh, realized how much the fans appreciated him, all the stuff that he did and all the accomplishments that he had when he was there. Um, you know, because sometimes the, the fans that are the most vocal are the fans that are your worst enemies at times. And so, to, you know, sometimes I think that's maybe some of the noise that he heard when he was here. Um, and uh, I think when he heard that crowd and the, you know, ovation that they that they gave him, I think that that I think about, you know, I think it got him really, I actually know it got him really emotional. And, uh, you know, I think it was a special moment for him and, you know, really for all of us to see that and the, how the Cougar fans appreciated him. And, and uh, you know, he's done, he's done amazing things for our football program here. And he's, you know, one of the uh, legacies in our program, I believe. And shoot, I played for him and the things we accomplished. I did, you know, I don't think the program would be where it is today without Bronco Mendenhall. BYU special teams, the defensive end coach Kelly Papinga on the Wise Guys tonight, live on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and wiseguys.com. After Virginia, you go to Boise State, where again you've got to watch BYU march down the field uh, and and score a winning touchdown with Puka Nakua making a phenomenal play that your defender did everything he possibly could to keep yep. Puka from making that catch. And uh, and the Cougars get you again. This is just the this is just the <laughs> conversion process of getting you back, right? I, I guess I had to go through all this personally, but I I, I remember sitting in the locker room that night because you know being a being a coach and a player for BYU, you get you get kind of you know crap throughout the whole week. Everybody's like, oh, we got to you know for Papinga, we got to get these guys, you know they're, and you know it's just this whole talk and. And uh, and I, I wanted that game so bad because, you know, shoot, you want to beat your former team. And, uh, you know, and especially how it turned out the year before, I thought, man, we, I, I, I got to put forth a better effort. And uh, we played better that night. But still, the offense for BYU that night, I told a I'm so glad I'm coaching with him now so I don't have to face his dang offense. <laughs> it's the, the explosive plays that he puts up all the time. And it's, you know, it's not just against – the times I played them I and you, you it's against everybody they're doing it against everybody and it's you know I'm glad I'm on that side where I don't have to defend it because I think he's put up a good scheme but you know that night you know I thought you know that fourth quarter all of a sudden turned into it like was the Virginia game all over again you know kind of was slow there for three quarters and then all of a sudden man the fourth quarter just both teams just took off and uh I thought we had I thought we had them honestly especially I think it was fourth and six yeah and he'd been pretty good all year in the red zone and I felt like we had a pretty good call. And really what they decided to do is, hey, we're going to take, you know, 20, you know, 20 guys out of this equation. And we're going to say, hey, our guy against, you know, their guy. And really, that was our best cover guy all year, Caleb Biggers. And, uh, you know, Nakua just made a better play, probably one of the most impressive catches I've ever seen. And, and uh, you know, hats off to them that night for uh, that game. It was, a you know, a great atmosphere. And it's never hard it's never easy to go up there and win, you know, win in Boise on the blue and, you know, BYU's done it uh, multiple times now, which is pretty impressive. Yeah. It's so, so now you hear about the changes that are happening at BYU and, and obviously this, this is home for you. I mean, like, welcome home. We're welcoming you home and, and everybody's welcoming you home. This is where you belong, right? H- how does that all transpire? Do you reach out first? Does BYU reach out to you? Take us through that time as you're recognizing there might be opportunities here and, and this would be a great fit for you to come back. Yeah. So it, you know, it really happened really fast. So we, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember, we played Utah state, um, on a Friday night that the uh, Friday after Thanksgiving. And I can't remember. I remember that was the night BYU played Stanford the next night. I think BYU yeah. played Stanford and, uh, I think on Monday, um, some not Kalani, but somebody reached out to me just saying, "Hey, would you be interested?" And I said, "Well, yeah, I, you know, it's BYU. I I would definitely listen." And then, you know, Kalani had reached out to Coach Avalos, and I think all week they'd kind of been playing phone tag going back and forth because we were getting ready for the Mountain West Conference Championship game. So, you know, BYU was getting ready for the bowl game, and I think out recruiting, and we were trying to get ready to to win a conference championship. And so it wasn't a, it wasn't ideal, and I was trying to stay as focused as I could on making sure I was putting my my best foot forward to help those kids up there win because we had had a pretty good year. And, uh, you know, as the week went on, kind of back and forth, and finally I think they had connected a little bit on Friday before the game, 
just saying, and, you know, Kalani saying, Hey, I, you know, I'd like to talk to Kelly about some openings. And, um, and then from there, it just kind of went forward from there. And Saturday, the game ended. And I think um, Andy and uh, Kalani talked after the game. Kalani told them that he was going to offer me a job Saturday night. And, uh, you know, that night I had about a couple of hours to decide if I was going to take the job because um, Kalani needed me here um, in Provo to start recruiting and start helping, you know, uh, get this defensive uh, roster put together and help this defensive staff get put together. And so it, it happened really quickly after the game. And I remember about 10, 10 30 that night, I called, I called Andy and told him that I was going to accept the job and had to call my players up there, which was really hard to do because I'd grown close to those guys and, and shoot that Sunday, uh, things were, things were in the works to get me back to Provo. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was an exciting time. It happened really fast. I don't know if my wife really appreciated how fast it happened, <laughs> but, uh, but no, we're we're happy to be back here. And that that's actually what we were doing today. We just moved into our house today, and that was a whirlwind this morning. And so trying to get all you know all that situated and going through all those motions now, and getting our kids in school and all that stuff. It's it's been a whirlwind over the last month for sure. Well, here you are now back in Cougar Blue, and Jay Hill wants an aggressive defense. What will that require of your edge rushers? Yeah, number number one, I think I think it always starts with run defense and how I've always coached. So defensive ends, outside backers, I look at the same way. It's really the same exact thing I've uh, I did under you know in um, in Bronco scheme and really the same thing I did at Boise State. Just calling it different things. You know, with Bronco we call them outside backers. At Boise State we call them edge players. Here we call them defensive ends. But it's really all the same thing, and it, I think it starts with those guys and setting edges in the defense. Um, and so that's making sure that you know we're we able to win one on ones in the run game versus tight ends and offensive tackles, and then we're able to on stunts be able to slip inside of those guys as well and get TFLs as we saw Kyle Van Oy do a ton of. And our scheme does similar things that you know we did with Kyle on the edge. And then after that, after we stop the run, I think you know to be aggressive. Um, you have to have a great pass rush. And you just look at these schemes, not just what he did at Utah, but what he's done at Weber State. He's had a great pass rush, great pass rush. And if you don't have great pass rush, then um, you're leaving those corners and those safeties out on the island all night long. And uh, that's why this defense over the years is just time tested. They've been able to get great pass rush with great man-to-man coverage and mixing in some other zones. And, uh, you know, so I tell my guys, I, I said, really, we have two jobs. We got to keep it simple. We got to set the edge of the defense in the run game. We got to be able to, get, you know, attack the quarterback in the pass game. And if we do those two things, then we'll be very successful as a group. And I feel like we have we have the group to do some damage this year for sure. That's fun stuff. You know, I had a lot of conversations over the years with with Broncos old mentor Rocky Long, and I used to say to him, "Man, how do you get corners that can cover like this?" And he'd say, "Blaine, you're misunderstanding everything. We don't have good corners." That's, that's we just get to the quarterback so fast they don't have to cover for very long. And I was like, okay, that's I like that philosophy. Um, I wanted to ask you, you're not the only one coming down from Boise State. You brought along with you defensive tackle Jackson Cravens, Kyle Whittingham's nephew, Julie's son, which I think is awesome. And then edge rusher um, Isaiah Bagna, both transferring to BYU. What do they bring to the D-line? You know him better than anybody. Yeah, so just starting with Jackson, I just I was always impressed with Jackson's work ethic. He um, smart, tough, um, no nonsense. I mean, uh, Coach Milo was the D line coach up there, and he coached those guys really, really hard. And I never saw Jackson ever complain. Um, he was just went out there, did his job, was super physical. Um, he's more athletic than he appears. He's one of those guys that has like kind of that little hidden athleticism because you look at this guy and you're like, man, he looks kind of you know oh he looks older he, he fits in well with the BYU guys you know, <laughs> you know so you look at him you're like man this guy doesn't look you know so much like a football player but man when he puts the pads on and uh he he goes to work on the inside and I was just super impressed with just not just his physicality but his athleticism and those two things combined for a defense alignment plus toughness and and being relentless I think is a great combination and so I was excited to see when he decided to come here and uh you know get you know <laughs> his deal was just getting close close to family he wanted to get back close to family and and shoot he grew up two blocks away from the stadium right. so you know it's it's close to home for him and then isaiah he was a guy this last year that we tried at inside backer 
we were trying to get our best 11 on the field and we were pretty loaded on our edge um, position at Boise last year. And so we were trying to get, and I, Isaiah was one of our better players. And so we were trying to get him on the field. So we moved him to inside back early in the season and really just didn't go as planned as we will. He's a true edge rusher. And so, um, but he can't play stack backer. And if you go back to the 2021 film, he had a great game against BYU, um, had some really good games against Nevada, a really good game against, um, there's another game he had three sacks, and I'm trying to remember. Maybe it was Nevada, and then he had another game against New Mexico. Anyway, he had four or five games in that 2021 year that were just as good as anybody I'd seen in a long time. And really, when I turned on the film, he reminds me of a, of a Brian Kill. Mm. Um, he, he moves like Brian. He's athletic but like Brian. He's versatile where he can drop into coverage, but he can rush off the edge. He, um, there's a lot of stuff you can do with Isaiah. He's nearly you know, 6'4", 230 pounds, but can run. Um, so he's he's an exciting guy, to, you know, exciting piece to have because you can do a lot of stuff with those type of guys. Kelly Popenga led BYU in tackles his senior year with 113 in the linebacker spot. Cougars went 10-3 and three that year. He's back coaching the edge rushers and special teams coordinator. Happy to have him on the wise guys. Uh, your list of alumni who you've coached, uh, Kyle Van Noy, Fred Warner, Sione Taki Taki, Spencer Hadley, and it goes on and on and on. And so, of course, everyone has huge expectations for you to find some more of these. <laughs> Just got to live up to that. That's guys. all, Kelly. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a pretty good group. Uh, yeah, that's, that's called great recruiting. And you know what? A lot of, I get credit for recruiting these guys. You got to credit Barry Lamb, Paul Tidwell. Uh, Lance Reynolds, they recruited a lot of those guys and they just kind of fell in my lap when I got here. So I was like, <laughs> you know, the guys that I truly recruited, Fred, I truly recruited, um, you know, Siona, I truly recruited, you know, Troy Hines was another four star, star guy that just, you know, injuries, but great high school player that we recruited that never just, you know, was healthy enough to finish his career. But, you know, a lot of those guys early in the career, I just got lucky to be the coach at the time, <laughs> you know thank Paul Tidwell and Barry Lamb and Lance for recruiting those guys. But, you know, the guy that I honestly take the most pride on is Ziggy because, you know, myself and coach Kafusi and Bronco, you know, it took three of us. We didn't have to do any recruiting. That was all development. And it went from Bronco to me to Steve back to me, back to Bronco. I mean, it was the three of us for a three year time frame of developing this guy. And we saw what he could become. And, you know, it took a lot of us, you know, kind of, telling him what he could be and then you know shoot i couldn't tell you how many times that guy wanted to quit and we had to talk him out of quitting <laughs> and then shoot three years later this guy's a you know the fifth overall pick and so you know i you know obviously it's hard to find ziggy on sauce but um it was it was a process and a great process to, to develop somebody like that yeah there's there's not many ziggy was a freak among freaks in the nfl and yeah. that, that's saying yeah. something so when you look over this defense, and I know you haven't had a chance to be in spring ball, it's probably, probably going to take that, but does anybody jump out at you where you're like, wow, this guy's got some potential to be really, really good with as, as we develop him? Yeah, I think, you know, the guy that continued to, um, and this is not at my position. I can get to my position. The guy that continued to jump out to uh, Coach Hill and I was uh, Bywater, Ben Bywater. Yeah. And then, you know, I think he showed it in the bowl game, and I think he has a chance. Um, to fit into this scheme really, really well. But as far as just talking to my position, the guy that, you know, I've been just really um, impressed with from day one, from his practice habits to the tools that he has, to the body that he has is uh, Tyler Batty. And I think he has a chance to be a really good leader for our team. And I just, I like his mindset. I like his work ethic. Um, and I just, you know, he has a great body, different type of body than what I've really, you know, really more of a, uh, man, not, I think he's more athletic than a Jan Jorgensen. And he's not quite as athletic as a Ziggy. Um, he's kind of right in that, you know, that middle ground between those guys that are both really good players, but kind of remind me, you know, has some traits of both of those guys. Um, and so I, you know, I'm anxious. We're going to put him at our bull position, which is our, our bigger defensive end position. And, uh, you know, I think he can do, do some really good stuff for us at that position. I'm excited to coach him. A few more questions for Kelly Papinga, the big 12 schedule when that came out, uh, what did you think? <laughs> I was, you know, it's awesome. You know, when I left BYU to go to Virginia, the thing that I loved the most was playing in a conference again. And I think all of us that had been, you know, independent for five years and, you know, independence was fun. We were able to go all over the country, play all these different teams, but it just, it was hard um, to really know what, um, you're playing for week in and week out. You know, there was this pride that you wanted to play for, 
Um, but really, if you ended up losing one or two games, it was tough to really get to your ultimate goal. We wanted to play in a New Year's Six Bowl game every year. And that was tough to do once you lost, you know, that first or second game, obviously. And so once we got to the ACC and being able to just play, um, you know, that conference schedule and um, be able to play those teams year after year after you get to know the players really well. You get to know the coaches really well. You get to know the schemes. And then it's fun because, you know, now there's this game within the game each year of, okay, what are they going to do that they did last year? What are they going to do different? And it's just, man, it just, it, it, it was fun to do because I had uh, my first two years as a coach. Um, we were still in the Mountain West. And then after that was independent and just being back um, and being able to play for a conference championship. And every year that we were there, except for our first year, right at the end, we had a chance every year. And that was fun. You know, our last yeah. two games, we were still in it to be, you know, competing for something, playing for something. And uh, it's just I'm excited to get back, you know, into that conference play again. Yeah, we look at that November schedule, Kelly, and, and it's just like, Oh, it's like hallelujah. I mean, BYU's had such a hard time in Independence having November schedules. You know, it's just always patchwork. And, and you go at West Virginia, Iowa State at home, Oklahoma at home, and finish up on Thanksgiving weekend at Oklahoma State. That that run at the end of the season, that's something special to play those teams all in conference. And hopefully you guys go to Oklahoma State with something on the line. When you look at that November schedule, what what goes through your mind? Yeah, uh, it reminds me, like, just going back to, to my coaching career, it reminds me of just the ACC. And, you know, we always ended the year with Pitt and Virginia Tech, who were who became two of the better teams when we were in the ACC. And so you got to play your best ball in November, and no matter what. And, uh, you know, those teams right there, Iowa State, even though they had a down year a year ago, man, the years previous to that, playing great defense and really one of the more physical and more consistent teams in the Big 12. So that's no cupcake there. And, you know, obviously traveling out to West Virginia and that atmosphere is going to be unbelievable. It's going to be awesome. And, uh, you know, those two teams at the end, you know, they, they've both probably been, you know, two of the most consistent teams over the past, you know, five, six years in, in the Big 12. So it's I think it's a great test for our team. But the thing that I'm I'm really excited about that I think BYU's done a great job of is I think this team's prepared. This team's more prepared for a Power 5 schedule than I think any team that's come from um, you know, you can say independent G5, whatever, but not being a power five team to becoming a B power five team, BYU has to be the best prepared team that's ever made the jump um, just based upon the the independent schedules we've had, especially the last two years. I mean, just the, the teams that we played, where we played them, how they played um, our, our record, especially against the Pac-12, I think shows that uh, we can play against these power five teams week in and week out. And so, um, you know, I think it's an exciting time. I think the guys are excited for it. I think they're prepared for it. And, uh, yeah, it's just it's it's just time. You guys know it. We've been waiting for this time for a long time. <laughs> As BYU fans and alumni and everything, this is uh, this is an exciting time to be a part of BYU football. Well, K-Pop, we've, we've toyed with the idea. We have. I don't know if you can see our studio from on your view, but we have all the Big 12 up here. You know, Nixon keeps telling us we need to hang a Pac-12 championship banner up here from two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> we might do uh, it. We just might do it. These uh, uh, yeah, that would that would uh, get some people fired up up north. Oh yeah, <laughs> yes it would. Um, you're out recruiting now, kids for the future. As the the recruiting class has already been announced uh, last week, how big of a deal is Big Twelve membership being a P five, even instantly um, for you on the recruiting trail? Yeah, I think it's um, it's maybe the biggest. Um, you know, I don't like to say sales pitch, but I think that one of the biggest um, advantages that we have in our program right now is just, I think for a long time, uh, there's a lot of players that wanted to come to BYU, but ultimately they wanted to play power five football. Yeah. And there's just something about playing power five football and playing at the biggest stage. And not that BYU was a big stage, but it wasn't the biggest stage in some of these kids' minds. And I think now you, you add what BYU's done historically and you add to what our home atmosphere is and you add to the collective and you add to all these different resources that BYU can provide. There's there's going to be um, there's not there's not many teams that I think can provide what we can, especially the type of kid that we're looking for um, that fits BYU. And so um, I just know from, you know, recruiting independently from the you know seven years ago when I was last year to now, this is a completely different deal. And just the guys that I've been able to talk to and how interested they are um, from all around the country. Um, it's, it's for me, it's a different feel than it's ever been. And, uh, you know, I just feel like we're going to have a chance with, with every guy that, uh, um, that we're going to want to have a chance with. 
Kelly Papinga, BYU's new special teams and defensive ends coach on the Wise Guys. All right, it's Super Bowl week. Let's go back in time to 2009. You're a free agent with the Cardinals. Cardinals are playing the Steelers in the Super Bowl. Um, what, where were you at with the with the franchise at this time? Were you on the practice uh, squad? Were you on the sideline? What? what I, yep. I've, I've Googled everything, and it just shows you're a free agent with the Cardinals this Super yeah, Bowl we, we season. Knew, we knew Brett was starting at D-tackle or DN <laughs> for the Steelers at that time, right? Brett Kiesel. Yeah. yeah, so I was I – was, so I think Aaron Francisco was on the team. He was starting safety. Yep. Um, and so I was, uh, I was on the practice squad that year that at that time as a linebacker. And so I went, I was earlier in the season, I was on the St. Louis Rams. Who were one of the, they were, I think were the worst team <laughs> in the NFL. I get cut right before Thanksgiving. And I'm thinking I got cut from the worst team in the NFL. I am oh, just, man. you know, I'm terrible. I'm like, okay, career's <laughs> over. And then the very next day, the Cardinals call me and say, Hey, we need a linebacker. And so I, I finished the season with them. So it was late November. Um, the week after Thanksgiving to uh, all the way through the Super Bowl, uh, my wife and I were, were, were with the Cardinals and it was it was an awesome experience. So uh, for that game, I was on the sideline. We played in Tampa Bay. And uh, so I was on the sideline. I wasn't dressed out, but I was on the sideline. And if you watch closely on that James Harrison uh, pick six, <laughs> I could have stuck my foot out and tripped him. And really made some noise on that play right there. But, I, I mean, I was right there on the sideline. And at, um, really, when the play started, I remember a bunch of us, because the play was all the, all the way down on the opposite end zone. And we were on the field, so we had a good view to see what was going on. And then all of a sudden, when the play started happening, and I'm like, oh, crap, this play is actually coming at us right now. We all had to take a step backward. <laughs> and uh, I'm not kidding you. I could have stuck my foot out to trip James Harrison and, and uh, maybe not one of the biggest plays in, uh, you know, Super Bowl history. Oh, that would have been the big. Like, you, we'd still be watching <laughs> that video. So it's probably good that you didn't because we'd be watching it for the wrong reasons. Now, Bruce Spring Springsteen was a halftime show for that one. Oh, we yeah. Did, I'm, a, hey, I'm a big Bruce Springsteen Well, we all, we all are really huge, right? Yeah. So did you did you get to stay out or did you have to go to the locker room? Could you stay no, out and watch that at halftime? No, I didn't get to stay out. But my wife, oh. an old school camcorder, she she videoed it for me. <laughs> so I got it somewhere on some like old cassette tape somewhere. I got to pull out and listen to Bruce Springsteen's halftime show. Oh, so, man. So she got to see Springsteen. She got to and you, and you were in the locker room. That's just wrong. <laughs> so Andy Reid and the Chiefs take on the Eagles Sunday in the Super Bowl. Who do you have? Oh, I got to go. You got to go with the Chiefs. You got to go with Andy Reid and uh, just, you know, great guy. Unbelievable coach, but I think even a better person. And uh, I don't know him great. And um, just the interactions I've had with him a few times. I mean, he's he's treated me like I'm his best friend. I don't even I barely know the guy. Yeah. And so just, uh, you know, when you meet people like that in the coaching world, you want those guys to have a lot of success. And just, you know, especially going against this old team and just being, you know, something about going against Philadelphia, you just want him to just, you know, put it on those guys and just kind of, you know, to all those Eagles fans that just kind of gave him a little bit of crap for never winning the Super Bowl, you just hope that he's able to pull one off against his old team. Yeah, he, he's in rarefied air. He's, he's already a Hall of Famer, but he wins this Super Bowl – yeah. Like he's he's in a class all by himself. So we're we're rooting for Andy too. Hey hey, uh, K-pop spring practice begins in about a month. Um, goals for the defense and, and and for the staff during those six 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 weeks of workouts. What what do you try to get done between now um, and the end of spring ball? Yeah, I think you know as we talk about it as a staff defensively, as you come in with a with a new scheme and a new staff. I think there's a couple of things that you you always want to be able to to get done through spring brawl. Is number one, we got to make sure we're developing, you know, our our culture and how Coach Hill wants, you know, what this um, defense, how it's going to identify us. And so we'll build that culture during spring ball. There'll be different things that these guys haven't done in a long time, uh, just different practice habits and um, different drills and ways that we're going to create, you know, physicality and toughness and aggression. And, and so there's, yeah, that, that's going to get established and there's going to be guys that, yeah, we're going to see, we're going to see how they like it, you know, cause it's going to be, there's going to be some friction there. I already know it, but um, <laughs> just based upon what I've seen in workouts though, I don't think there's going to be many guys that back down. I think they, they actually want um, the style of play and, you know, the way that we're going to coach them. I think um, they're just, they're just looking forward to that and, and that opportunity. And then, you know, for us just developing, simple skills and fundamentals that can help you be a good defense. And so just being great tacklers, I think, you know, that's something that 
coach, uh, coach Hills, um, you know, talked about, and then being able to just know how to defeat blocks and, you know, play the run game. That's something too. And then just being great in, in, in pass rush and, uh, you know, affecting the quarterback and being great in coverage. And so if we can get, if we can get those things done and, uh, you know, also emphasize takeaways. That's something that uh, we've emphasized as well. Um, just being able to focus on those four things, I think, will help us take the you know the next step, getting ready for summer training and then getting ready for fall camp. Special teams wise, you got to replace Old Droid, your place kicker, you get your punter back, and Ryan Rico. And, and what about kickoff returns, punt returns? Uh, what do you like there? Everybody wants another James Die. Like yeah, they do you, want do James have one die. of those or a Vice Sikahema, please. <laughs> Yeah. Can you find so us a vice to get him a Pro Bowl NFL punt return guy? <laughs> yeah. So I, I I think Sol J can be that guy. I really do. I really, think I love that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that was something Fessy and A Rod had brought up to me when I got here, and I saw it in the bowl game. And when they told me that they were moving him to running back, I thought, man, that was the first thing that popped in my head is this guy could be a great kick returner, great punt returner. But I do think Hobbs, he has he has um, some skill at, at punt return. And I do think that's that is his strength is punt return more than kick return. I do think we need to find a, a dynamic speed guy um, that's willing to just hit it, that's fearless in the kick return game. And I think there's some options there that we have. I think Soljay could be another guy. I do think the uh, Rapati Hinkley is another guy. I li- I've always liked running backs at uh, a kick returner because I think they're more used to running in – in small spaces and that's where i think receivers unless they're a fearless receiver always struggle is because you know those guys are used to running out in open space yeah. or running they're used to running between the tackles running in those confound spaces and and they're you know those short um you know uh sudden cuts that they have to make and so if you can find a speedy back that's fearless i think those guys um can be great and like that adam hine my last year here 2014 and 15 he was i thought one of really the better kickers why you had seen in a long time and uh, that was adam's deal yeah i mean he just ran straight ahead and i think he had two or three touchdowns between 14 and 15 yeah we and, were on uh, the we were on the call when he took one what yeah. 99 yards against virginia love adam yeah. Virginia, exactly I, I love showing that to our virginia guys that <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it was a great team cool what not to do <laughs> you you appreciate that you appreciate this k-pop we we had ronnie jenkins on the show a couple weeks ago and he was he made the he was a pro bowl um, led the league in kick returns when he was with the Chargers. And we were talking to him about what makes a great kick returner. And he goes, well, you know when you boil it all down? I was just really, really fast. That's what <laughs> yeah. he said. He said, I was, just, I was just blazingly fast. And we're like, okay, well, that helps. We'll try to find a guy that has that. <laughs> so, Yeah, that's uh, that's always a great quality, man. If you can catch that ball and go 99 yards in about five seconds, you know, with the football in your hand and all those pads on, then – you know, you're our type of guy. And I think, you know, this, uh, this Kingston kid, they told me a lot about, uh, you know, they, uh, I think he's from Northern Utah. He redshirted last year. A-Rod really track high star. Yeah. Really, really fast. He feels like he's a, he's an option too as well. So, um, yeah, I think, I think we've got some good options there for Sweet. us. Love it. All Love right. It. We've got five questions for you and then we'll let you go continue to unpack. Uh, All right, we sure great. appreciate your time. Um, yeah, we do. You just these are just top of your head. You just you just we throw them at you, and this lets everybody get to know you a little bit. Favorite sports movie? Who uh, remember the Titans? Titans. Yeah, great one. You know what? I did wasn't didn't Nick say that too? Didn't Dave Nixon say that too? I think so. Yeah, just like your boy one. Dave Nixon. So <laughs> remember the Titans. Favorite singer or band? We talked about Bruce Springsteen. I, he's not quite my favorite, so I gotta go. Um, I got to go with the Beatles. I'm a big Beatles guy. That's classic. old. That's classic old school. I love it. Breakfast yep. favorite breakfast cereal. Favorite breakfast cereal. Oh, even though I haven't had it in a long time, now that you bring it up, I'm, I'm going to go buy me a box of Fruity Pebbles. Nice. Oh, I have a brand new box of Fruity Pebbles up in my cupboard right Listen, now. Listen, when you're done with the f- pebbles, <laughs> it's flavored milk. It's like a win-win. Yeah, it's the best thing exactly. ever. Exactly. F- favorite defensive play at BYU. Ever. Like and it, highlight? Yeah, it doesn't even have to be the one that you were on, like coached, played, or yeah. saw. What's the favorite defensive play you've ever seen at BYU? I, I think it's got to be Kyle Van Oy. I mean, I could pick 90 plays of Kyle Van Oy, but it's got to be Kyle Van Oy in the um, 2012 Poinsettia Bowl on the strip sack fumble for a touchdown because it completely turned the game. And then yeah. a couple plays later, he gets a pick six. So <laughs> we, we I'd have to go with the strip sack. We talk about that all the time, Kelly. We were like, when does a defensive player ever go? Okay, 
well, I'm just going to have to take this game over all by myself yeah. and actually do it. That, that's one of the greatest defensive performances I've ever seen in my life. Was a lot Rogue. of people, you know, forget about that game too. He's yet a block punt in that game as well. That's yeah. set up right. I think another. So it's just like, I mean, the guy, took, he literally took over the game and really probably statistically, I like to say probably the biggest, you know, the, the greatest defensive season in maybe BYU history in 2012. Yeah, phenomenal. So, okay, favorite piece of advice that your wife Rebecca ever gave you? <laughs> I hope she's uh, listening right Take now. the job might uh, be it, but I don't know. I wish she was here right now so she could hear this. But uh, <laughs> Well, she can, it's on a, it'll be on a podcast tomorrow. There, she can listen. Tell her, honey, just listen to the last 15 seconds. <laughs> Don't say too much. Listen more, speak less. That's what I would probably say. Oh. Listen more, speak less. Smile more, talk less. That's from Hamilton, remember? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's, that, that's what uh, they kept telling Alexander Hamilton. Smile more, talk less. So <laughs> so when you see Kalani. She said, so she said, listen more and talk less. Oh. You could pass that advice on to Kalani in your next team meeting. Kalani. <laughs> Listen, listen more, more talk, talk less. less. <laughs> Kalani's a good listener. Come on. Hey, that's those, that's some great advice. So, no, These, that is. That's, that's great. That's, we're going to all follow that one. Well, we're, hey. we're, we're so glad to have you back in the fold. And uh, we're, all root, we're all rooting for you to have great success. I have to tell you, you you'll love this. So I, I went to a City League basketball game in Lehigh last week because Kellen told me to come up. And on this City League team is Kellen and Landon, Mike Muehlman, and the great Brian Keel. And uh, you should see Brian Keel running up and down the floor. It's still like, I'm like a dude that big is not supposed to be able to run that fast up and down. He can still bring it, Kelly. It's just crazy that Brian Keel can still move like that at that size. It's nuts. That's why, that's why he played, whatever, six or seven years in the NFL. And I only made it one because freak athletes, just can, they can do it for a long <laughs> yeah. period of time. It was Listen. fun to watch him. You need to join that team. You'd be a nice addition to that City League team with, with those guys. <laughs> I'll just He's, sit like in the baseline. That's all about a guy. I got a good baseline jumper, and that's about it. The greatest thing that ever happened to Brian Kill was catching that Hail Mary pass from Max Hall in the alumni game. The alumni game, game last I year. I couldn't believe that. I was like, Brian, that's the <laughs> biggest celebration you've ever had in your career. You didn't even so celebrate that much when we beat Utah in 07. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, thanks for being with us. We'll see you at practice. We appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thanks for having me on.